Welcome to this Git Primer for Linguistics. And in this uh, video, we are going to have a look at Git as a source and version control solution that can be used in linguistics and especially in corpus linguistics. Please note that this is not a full tutorial, but this is really just a primer because um, working with Git is or it can be quite complicated um, and you will have to consult other tutorials and resources that are specific to whatever software and solution you're using. But the idea is to give you a basic understanding of how Git works, um, why you might want to use it. And then there's also a about 20 minute demo where I show some of the core concepts. All right, so uh, what about version control? So you might've seen something like this. Um, we have a folder and in that folder you have a couple of files. Uh, here I have essentially three files, A, B, and C, uh, A1000, B1001, C1002. And if you work with these files, imagine that this is like a small corpus. Um, many people um, start over, many people um, use these kind of naming schemes to keep track of their different file versions. And um, sometimes those works, but uh, more often than not, um, this is really horrible, or at least it gets horrible quite fast, especially if you're working with multiple people and then some people um, don't manage to send you their version right away and you don't know who has which version and people use different naming schemes and it just gets, gets really messy quite fast. Especially if we think about um, doing this with a thousand files or with 10,000 files. And let's say you have a big corpus and someone is doing annotation and someone else is correcting files and a third person maybe is is trying to to get rid of, of some some sort of um, excess data that you don't want in these files and it's just a it's just a big mess. And now version control and git is one solution um, helps you with that. So version control essentially is software that tracks, all changes in files and folders over time. And what it basically does is it allows you to go back to any previous state. So let's say you've made changes to a couple of files or someone has made some changes to some of the files. Um, the version control system will always keep track of who changed what at which point in time. And you can just go back and you can go forward. You can move around in these files. And it also allows you to effectively and safely collaborate. And what does safely mean? Safely means that you can collaborate without um, risking to override someone else's changes. And it helps you to safely integrate changes um, automatically. And Git, again, is one solution. There are many, but Git probably right now is the most widely used. It's primarily used in uh, computer science and software development, but it's very useful for linguistics too, because we are often working with plain text files. And this is just a brief uh, recap for uh, those who've never heard this term. So essentially there are two types of text files. There's plain text files and rich text files. Uh, rich text is, for example, Microsoft Word, where you have formatting in your files. So there could be something bold and you have font sizes and you, have, you can have images in these files and so on. Whereas plain text files are just text. And these kind of different structure but uh, technically speaking, they're always the same. Um, so here we have a basic file with just text. Then we have some sort of HTML, XML. We have a comma separated thing, and then we have a bit of Python code. But it comes down to plain text. It's just files with just text in them. No formatting, very straightforward, just plain text. And version control, and especially Git, while it works with other types of formats, it is specifically built for plain text files and it works perfectly with them. And that makes it very useful for corpus linguistics since in corpus linguistics, we very often work with plain text documents. Just keep that in mind. Um, it works with other types of files, but most of the features only work with plain text. So let's look at the basic workflow here. And this probably is a bit of a, so we're going at this from the deep end. So in Git, you have so-called branches. So here we have two branches, a main branch and a so-called annotation branch. And each branch consists of commits. You can think of branches as timelines. So um, the first commit here to the left in the main branch, that's the initial state of our data. And then whenever we make changes, we can make commits and we can basically say, okay, I've now made a couple of changes. I now want to have a snapshot. And these snapshots are called commits. 
And whenever you want to switch between different states, you can basically switch between commits. So whenever you've committed something, you've made a snapshot in time. And from now on until ever, you can always go back to the snapshot and you can jump between these snapshots however you like. Now, what you can also do is you can also say, okay, I have a certain stage state here uh, in my files, and now I want to create a second branch. I want to have a secondary timeline, a totally new timeline on which I can do changes, in which I can do my own little commits, on which I can do my own snapshots. And this branch will not impact the other main branch, at least not if I don't want this. So let's say you have a corpus, and now you want to add another layer of annotation. But of course, you don't want to modify the original files. So you could create a branch um, like it's done here. And then you add your annotations. And while you do this, you maybe do three commits um, because maybe you do a first run, then you do some corrections and then someone else corrects that, whatever, however you want to do it. So you create a secondary timeline and in the secondary timeline, you make all these changes. And then at some point you decide, okay, now I, I would like to combine these two branches. I'm now very content with the changes I made. I now want to add this to my main branch. And you can do this, and that process is called merging. So how could this be used? This is a very powerful feature. It sounds easy, but it's, it, it's, it, it's, it is easy, but it's very powerful. The idea is, let's say you um, have like a little side project, or you want to write a paper, or you want to focus on some specific aspect, and you need to make some modifications to some of your files. Now, instead of creating a new folder and have multiple copies of these files and overcomplicating things, you're just creating a branch. You're now working within that branch. Everything you do happens within that branch. And after you finish, you can either just leave that branch and have these changes on a separate timeline. Or you can say, what I, what I did was great. I want to integrate all of these changes into my uh, main data structure, so to speak. Or you can also discard these. Now, in addition, from a research perspective, this is also very nice because if you want to reproduce something or if you want to understand why something doesn't work anymore, these commits allow you basically to have yeah safe points. You, you have snapshots in time um, that are exact representations of what the data looked at a specific point in time. So for example, whenever you are publishing something, you could create just a snapshot of your corpus at this point in time. And then if you ever wanted to go back to that particular uh, point in your research project or in your whatever you're doing, you can just head back to that commit and you have exactly the data as it was at that point in time. And that is really powerful. Now, there are a couple of key concepts. Um, so Git is a version control software. It's also a kind of an approach, um, but it's, it's the name of a software that you can have on your computer and that it can also run on servers. A repository is a set of files and folders um, that are under version control. And that means these files are managed by Git and these files are in, on these branches. Now, the staging area is a set of files and changes that are to be committed. Not every single change needs to be committed. So you could do a couple of changes to a couple of files and then you stage these and you basically tell Git, okay, these are, these are all the files I want to put into my new snapshot. And then you actually create that snapshot, you create that commit of the staged files. Now a branch, as I said, is a timeline within the repository and merging means we are bringing together two of these branches. And that's exactly what happened there. And that's the basic concept here. It's a very straightforward idea that has lots of interesting implications and that allows you to have very good control over your data. Now, looking at this graph here, we can also think about having multiple people working on this because the idea is, let's say you have three people working on the corpus, three people working on the data. Now you have your main branch and the main branch, so to speak, is the gold standard that that's at the corpus. And now you have two or three other people working on it. They can work on their own branches. They can make their own changes, they can experiment, they can do whatever they want. Um, and then whenever something is finished, you can review that and add that to the main branch. But you're never risking the integrity of the data. And that's just really, really nice. And also changes that other people make do not interfere with your changes. So let's say you're annotating 
um, a specific type of thing. Let's say you're annotating parts of speech and someone else is annotating something completely different. Now, both of you start from some point in the main branch and you don't have to worry about what the other person is doing at all. You just do your thing. And then during the merging process, the software will actually assist you in bringing everything together and will help you to then create a unified version of all of these changes, which individually can be tracked. And that's just a very powerful concept. Now, in the following, there is a 20 minute demo of using Git in Visual Studio Code in the command line. And then there's also a quick demo of using GitHub. GitHub is a um, yeah, commercial solution to Git. There are many other ways of doing this. Um, you don't have to watch these, uh, you don't have to watch these two demos, uh, but it's maybe an interesting uh, view into how this actually works. Now, a word of warning, uh, the demos are, again, fairly straight deep dive. Um, Git, especially for beginners, is a bit confusing and it looks like a lot of overhead, but you really get used to working like this and it's really a nice workflow. So don't get discouraged. And I also want to, again, uh, re-emphasize that also these two demos are not full tutorials. Um, I'm pretty sure that you won't be able to do, to do Git basically after watching this, uh, but it will give you a good starting point um, to look into Git and how this actually works. And there are wonderful tutorials out there, lots and lots and lots of wonderful tutorials that are much better than, than what I could do here. So uh, please don't get discouraged and have a look at that. Welcome to this demo in which we are going to use Git to um, manage a little corpus of three files. And for this tutorial or this demo, we are going to use uh, three files from the, from the old brown corpus. And we are also going to use Visual Studio Code. It's a very nice text editor that supports Git out of the box. And um, for this tutorial here, or for this demo here, we will be using the command line. And that is the, well, the basic, but also the hard way of using Git. And then we are also going to have a look at GitHub and see um, what that solution looks like and how you can work with this in a browser. Um, that's a little bit more uh, user-friendly, I would say. Um, all right, so we are now in a folder um, with three files. Uh, it's just a folder on, on my computer and I can type a door here. This, by the way, just for you to, to get oriented, this down here is the command line. I can type commands here. If you've never used this, don't be afraid of it. Um, you can just type commands here. These are the files, one, two, and three, right? And we are in a folder called demo. Again, these are the files here, and uh, that's what visual code looks like. All right, to start a new Git repository, we are going to type git init. That's just a command. And now we made this folder here, basically a repository. So in C slash demo in this folder, we now have a repository. And to the left here, we can see that something has changed. And Visual Studio Code has now um, recognized, okay, this is now Git repository. And I can look here on source control or version control, and we can see that we have these three files here. Now for all of these three files here, we can see a U. And this U means that these files are unstaged. They are in the folder, but they are not yet part of the repository. I can also type git status down here, and I can see that these are untracked files. So the first thing I want to do is I want to add these files to the staging area. I'm going to do this by typing git add star. That's all files. I could also be selective here. Um, git add star. I'm going to press enter. Nothing happens. But to the left, we can see that these files now have changed to um, A. So they are now added to the index. And if I type get status, we can see that they are now in the commit area. They are not yet committed. That's what we're going to do now. So we are now going to take a first snapshot of our corpus here. And to do this, we are going to type git commit minus m. And now I can, or I have to add a commit message. And that commit message basically is an explanation of what this snapshot is or why the snapshot exists. Um, so here, and this helps then other um, other people working with this data, or it helps me to go back if I need to revert to a certain stage or to a certain commit uh, in my process. So I'm going to just call this initial commit. That's just the first one. And now we have committed these. And now to the left, you can see that there are no changes. We now have a snapshot. Everything is as it is supposed to be. And now let's assume we are going to start working on these files. So for example, I see here in file A 
that there is these uh, there are these three spaces here. Let's say I want to get rid of these. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to save the file. And now my source control or my version control here realizes, okay, um, this file has been modified. And the fact that this has been modified now refers to the last commit, right? So as compared to the first commit, now something is different. Now let's say I, uh, this is all the changes I want to make. Let's say I want to commit this. So let's, let's look at what get status says. Get status says, okay, something, something has been modified. So first of all, I'm going to stage this. So git add, um, I'm just going to do the star again. I could also it's now say basically just git add brown one. So it's staged, git status, okay. And now let's commit this. And commit really means to commit it, to be committed to put this basically into the timeline. Uh, minus M, now I describe this, uh, remove um, spaces in line one, right? All right, one file has changed, one insertion, one deletion. Um, that's basically now uh, this secondary commit here. And to the left, we can see that we now have no changes again. So now let's have a look at our commit history so far. Okay, to do that, we can type git log, and now we see that there are two commits to this branch. The branch is master or main. Um, it's now called main. Um, Legacy-wise, it, it, it used to be called master. Um, we have these two commits. This is the messages for the commits. All right. Let's just now continue working. We don't have to think about Git that much. We just want to work here. And let's say we are going to check the other files. Ooh, file C has the same issue. So let's say we're going to remove this too because we realized, oh, that happened. Okay, good. Um, let's add this. And imagine that you would have to do a little bit more work. So git add star, git commit minus M again, um, remove space in line one, or spaces in line one, doesn't matter here. And we've committed that. All right, if we now look at the git log, we can see that we have three commits. Now, let's imagine that we now realized, oh, it wasn't a good idea to, to get rid of these spaces because we want to keep this corpus as it was initially, right? That could be a thing. So we want to go back now. We're going to go back to our initial state. How do we do this? Well, in Git, we can basically go back to any commit. And the terminology here is to check out a commit. So we're basically saying, hey, please give me the state that, that was at that given time. And to do this, uh, at least if we want to do it manually, we need the commit ID. And that would be this commit ID here. That is the one for the initial commit. And now we can say git checkout, and I'm going to give it this uh, commit ID. And now if I do this, um, we now change back to this initial state. And you can see here, oh, the uh, the space have reappeared here, the space have reappeared here. And we are now basically back at where we were at this point in time. And that's a very cool, very cool feature. And uh, we could now basically keep working here and say, okay, um, this, this, wasn't, this wasn't such a good idea. We are now back at where we are, where we are at. And this was the easiest way of doing this. There are many ways, and this has a lot to do with how you want to handle changes that basically happen after this. I'm not going into detail here, but basically you can look up various ways of doing this and you can then decide if you want to delete all the commits that have happened after these changes, or if you want to keep them uh, or how you want to treat these files. But basically you can go back to any point in time whenever you want to do this. All right, now let's have a look at branching for a second here. And for branching, so imagine, now let's imagine a scenario in which we realize, okay, so these files contain these line and file identifiers here, right? Let's say we want to get rid of these because we want to do some kind of analysis and we don't need them, but at least for this particular uh, sub project of ours but we don't want to destroy the file, so to speak, or we don't want to do anything to it. We also always want to be able to go back to the original. So this is a perfect scenario for branching. And to do this, we are going to again check out, but now we're not going to check out a commit, but we're going to check out a branch. So we say git uh, check out, and if it doesn't exist, it will be created uh, minus B for branch. And now we're going to give this a name. Um, so let's, let's call this just uh, maybe raw for example, and we're now on a new branch called raw. So we are now in our own little timeline. Everything we do here will not have any effect on the 
main timeline or in the main branch, right? So we can do whatever we want. We can experiment. Nothing is going to happen. We're not going to destroy anything. Okay, to do this, we're going to use a little bit of a regex here. So find and fi uh, replace in files, and we're going to look for uh, this regular expression here. This will match just the first ones here. And we are going to replace this with none. And we're going to make all of these replacements here. And now in all of our files, this is gone. All right. Now we want to save these changes, um, commit these changes. So we are going to git add all of our files. And we're going to git commit this with the message removed metadata slash annotation, um, for example. And now we've done that. All right, so we've rewritten all these files. We're going to get this message here. Uh, we can have a look at git status. And uh, all right, we are, we are good so far. Now, let's say we go back to our initial project. We want to have a look at what these files looked like before. We could just um, do a git checkout and go to the master. And now we see that all of the files have basically changed back to the state they were or to the state they are, not they were, to the state they are on the master branch. Now let's go back to raw because we want to keep working here. And now we have these optimized or these changed versions here. All right. All right. Now let's imagine a third scenario. And in that scenario, we have someone fixing mistakes or fixing little errors in the data uh, on their own branch. So now let's say we are the person who who, do, who does that. So we are in a branster, and we are going to uh, we're going to get our own little branch here. So we could check out minus b, and we are going to call this fixed, uh, for example, fixed files. And we are not on that branch. And let's say we go into this, and let's say in file b, we're not going to fix an actual issue here, but uh, let's just say um, we want to remove these uh, little symbols here because we don't like them. Um, so we get rid of them, all right? And we now say git add. So we, we, if you're committing this, git, uh, git commit minus m uh, symbols. All right, and now we're good here. Um, okay, now we want to, um, we now have reviewed these changes and we want to introduce them to our uh, main branch where you want to introduce them to our main data uh, source, so to speak, to our main timeline. So we do a git checkout uh, master. And now we're going to do a, a git merge fixed. And now what happens is we are still on main, but, or in master, um, but the changes from the fixed one are now in here, basically. And we've added them to this branch. So if someone else now keeps on working from the main branch, they will have these changes available to them. All right, as you've seen, working on the command line is a bit daunting, possibly. It gets better once, you, once you've done it a couple of times, um, but it's still not ideal for many. And there are lots of tools that help you. I mean, the editor helps you and so on and so forth. But a very common way of doing this is also online, uh, browser-based. And the most uh, commonly used solution for this is GitHub. And GitHub is a project or a company owned by Microsoft. And GitHub is basically a public and also people use private uh, Git server. It's not just Git, it's Git plus a lot of interesting tools that you can use. And um, it's right now also the go-to platform for uh, all types of open source uh, software. And we're going to have a look at how this works. Again, this is not going to be a comprehensive overview, but just so that you get an idea. Um, so I'm now logged in to GitHub and I'm going to create a new repository here. I'm going to call this Demo Corpus. Um, Demo Corpus uh, already exists. It's called Demo Corpus 2. Um, I'm going to set this private and I'm just going to create this repository. Now we are in this repository in the browser. And as this quick setup tool here already indicates, you can of course also use these so-called remote repositories using the command line or all these tools. 
So under the hood, it works exactly the same, but now the repository is on the internet in the cloud. And that of course is very useful if you are working with others. And that's probably also the default use case. So now this repository has a, an address. Um, this is this here, github.com slash my name slash demo corpus two. And now we could use this and some credentials, um, login information uh, to work collaboratively with others on this repository. So there's nothing in here right now. And I'm now just going to import these three files here. And this is very neatly done browser-based. I'm just going to basically drag and drop these three files in here. And for that, I'm going to click on upload an existing file. And this is that, and I'm now going just to drag these in. All right, so now these three files are being uploaded. And of course, I now can can do my first commit here. And my commit message, uh, again, will be initial commit. And commit these changes. And now these files are being processed. And now these are in my repository, at least in a second. And now here for each file, I can see uh, the last commit message here. Um, GitHub offers a lot of uh, additional features. It's very cool but I'm just going to recreate briefly what we've done before, at least roughly. Um, also note that this is the GitHub browser version, but there's also a very nice desktop version of GitHub that you can use to visually work with Git. So I'm going into this file here, the B file, and I can edit this file right here in the browser. Um, so let's say I'm going to remove these um, the symbols again. Uh, remove symbols. And now it asks me if I want to commit this to the master branch or do I want this commit to a um, new branch, but let's just commit it to the, to the master for now. So we've now changed our main branch, our main timeline. And we can now see here that there's a commit here. I have done this commit and this is the commit idea. We have a total of two commits here. Um, now let's create a new branch and I can do this here. Click on here and so I can see the branches. Find or create a new branch. Um, now let's uh, create a, a new branch for raw as we did before. Um, so I'm going to click here. Now we are in the raw branch and the raw branch now is has been created from the current status, the last commit of the master. Um, so now I'm not going to do the whole thing here, but let's open the file A and just do one little change here. So edit this file and we are going to remove just uh, the first three here, just for demo purposes. Uh, remove metadata. Uh, it's not really metadata, it's more like annotation, but still. And we're going to commit this to the raw branch. All right, that should work. All right, we can go back and now we can see that this happened. Uh, and we can now also see here that uh, raw had uh, pushes. A push is basically whenever you have a commit on a remote repository. Um, we can switch between these branches now. And what's also very nice is uh, we can visualize these things. So if we click on insights here and then we click on the network, we basically can see a visualization of what happened. So we have a commit here, then we have the second commit where we removed the symbols. And then from that second commit, we created a new branch, the raw branch. And in that raw branch, we did the remove metadata. So now let's do a merge here. So we are in um, our raw branch. And now we want to compare and make a pull request. Now in remote Git, it's not as easy as just creating a merge. But what a pull request is basically is we are making a request to have our changes, the changes from raw, imported into the master. So we're going to do this. I'm going to click here. And um, now I'm going to say the basis master, and we want to do raw in here. And GitHub tells us, okay, this is possible. We can actually do this. Um, so I'm going to create the pull request. And now imagine a situation in which you have a second contributor, and that second contributor has just made these changes. Now the second contributor creates that pull request, and now it's your job. And we are in pull requests here. Now it's your job to review those pull requests and then make a decision on whether you want to import these changes into your master branch. So uh, you can see here what happened. So we are trying to merge one commit, could be multiple ones, and one file has changed. And we can see here 
exactly what has happened. These are the changes that have happened on right. And now let's say we make the decision to actually merge them. So I'm going to click on merge pull request here. Um, I am going to give can I can give this a new um, a new description here, and I'm now merging this. And it's a little bit of a complicated process, but essentially it comes down to someone creates a branch, makes some changes, then decides that they want to have their changes added to the main timeline. Then they are creating a pull request, thereby asking the person in charge of the main timeline, hey. Uh, is, I, I'd like to merge these changes. Is this okay? Then the person responsible for the main timeline checks the pull request and then authorizes the merge or merges um, the data. So now this has been merged and we can go back and now we can see that everything has been integrated here. Let's have a last check at what the graph now looks like. So we can have a look at the network and now we basically see, okay, um, so there we created the second uh, branch, the raw branch. We made some changes and then this was integrated into the master or into the main branch. And this is essentially uh, how GitHub makes this process very uh, easy and also uh, very nice to do. There is lots and lots and lots of features here. Um, I've, I've not even shown you probably 1% of what's possible here. It's a very powerful tool, but uh, it's very easy to get into. And there are lots of tutorials that, that can help you out. So as we've seen, um, there are various tools. Uh, Git by itself, as we've seen, is a fairly complicated command line tool. But then there are these other solutions that make working with Git, especially remotely easier. Uh, for example, GitHub or GitLab. And GitLab uh, works very similarly to GitHub, but is an open source project. And then we've also seen that many tools and editors, for example, VS Code, support Git, and you can work with this. Now, finally, a couple of recommendations. Um, if you're working with plain text files, put all of your files under version control. It just makes your life a lot easier. And um, while it adds a little bit of overhead, um, you will definitely uh, profit from having this control over your data and from being able to go back. Use branching for experimentation, annotation, correction for whenever you want to make changes um, that that you might want to revert at some point or that that uh, multiple people want to work on at the same time. And explore the world of Git and all of the wonderful advanced features that are available. For example, if you use GitHub, you can have automated actions. For example, you could check your XML files uh, automatically for uh, formatting errors. And if you then commit something that has errors in it, uh, GitHub will actually tell you, hey, uh, please don't commit this. Uh, there are still mistakes in here. Please fix them before committing and things like that. So it's really, really cool. So have a look at that and enjoy working with Git.